Welcome to another edition of Official Insights, Modernizing Government, an interview series with government officials tasked with providing the public with accessible and efficient services, particularly as it relates to payments. This series is presented by our partners at American Express. I'm your host, Joe McKeating with Grant Street Group. Joining me today is Nassau County, Florida tax collector, John Drew. John, welcome. Uh, pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me today. So we have a lot to talk about today, what your office is doing, changes that we're seeing in the payments industry, obviously in one of the strangest years in modern times. But let's begin by telling the viewers a little bit about what role the Nassau County Tax Collector's Office plays in the community. Uh, the Nassau County Tax Collector, like all tax collectors in the state of Florida, is a, a very vast job. We collect not only, as the name says, all the property taxes for the county, but we also handle all the driver's license, car tags, titles, hunting and fishing license, concealed weapons permits, birth certificates. It's a large, large job that touches all facets of society. And when you have an office that handles that many responsibilities and so many processes in place, and then a year like the last one comes along, shuts down offices, at least temporarily, and moves so many things online, what was that challenge like for you? In an office that traditionally has been open five days a week, eight hours a day for the last hundred years, to shut down and the, the actual physical location, we, we left for a week that stacks up on you because people, whether there's COVID or whether there's not COVID, are going to need a driver's license. They're going to need to update their car registration because police are still out doing what they're supposed to do. You're going to need that identification card. And we're talking in a crisis situation for hospitalization, for any medical treatment, you have to show a current valid ID. It can't be expired. So those have to continue to be processed in order for government to function, in order for the police and the fire, road and bridge, anything involved with government, payment has to go to those people because they're working, they still have to be paid, so taxes have to be collected in order to make our society function. So by shutting that down, even for a few moments, backs up the system, but what we did is we really made a strong push more than ever to utilize technology instead of people coming to the office, take that opportunity to use a mobile device, use your computer from home, make those tax payments, renew your car tag online, renew your hunting and fishing online. All of these things we saw a major increase in the use of handheld, let's say portable devices with over 30% of the actual transactions taking place by telephone. And these are natural transitions that probably would have eventually uh, been pushed anyway by technology, but it seems like it got consolidated into such a short amount of time. How did you prioritize what to focus on first? That is an amazing question because you just don't know when it hits you all at once. Then we said, what is most critical? And if we're going to talk about keeping government functioning as well as taking care of the citizens themselves, collection of the tax payments and the distribution of those funds and driver's license, getting identification to those people that need it, those were our number one and number two critical things that we had to make certain were remained operational. And yes, we planned on pushing this out and have been using it for several years, but it wasn't necessarily the conscious push of leadership from our office. It was organic where people did not want to leave their homes. They didn't want to go out. They wanted that convenience. And by discovering, yes, I can make that payment from the privacy of my home. I can make that payment without going into a physical location we saw a dramatic shift in how citizens use technology in government. And did you, did you get specific feedback from the community about what they wanted to see from you, or did you base mostly on their behavior and then, okay, people want to pay online, so we need to offer more online services? Both of those happened. As we were pushing and as we were telling people, go to the website, read all the information that we've provided 
for new ways in order to transact business. They were calling in on the phones, wanting to know how they could do it. So they did want to know, but simultaneously, we're already pushing it on the other side and the operation was there and available for them. And you mentioned mobile a minute ago. Uh, how has that changed and have there been any surprises about mobile use as opposed to traditional PC? A lot of government organizations are just now coming on board with migrating their websites that have been pushed to laptops and desktops computers to become more mobile friendly, more mobile accessible. And working with the Grant Street Group, we have taken and transitioned our regular website to one that is mobile friendly so that when you pick up the phone, it doesn't display the entire front page, but only the main bullet points to try to help people navigate through significantly more efficiently and effectively. And by having that, we're seeing a recurring use of those that got it, they liked it. Now those people aren't coming to the office, they're maintaining and staying on that mobile device. So what's it doing for government? It's cutting back the amount of staff that we would have to go use physical manual labor at the desk, working with those customers as we go into the future, we're able to not hire more employees, but to use the same labor pool, but process more through the higher use of technology. So what you're saying is not only you've been able to meet your customers where they need to be met, they also apparently based on the recurring usage, feel that that experience is as good as coming into the office, as good or better as that experience. How do you ensure still that, that human touch, which sometimes can be lost with technology? We still maintain a presence if they need assistance. It is a human that they get when they dial the telephone. We can assist them for those that aren't technically savvy to walk them through the process. And that happened hundreds, if not thousands of times because there are generational gaps between those that utilize mobile devices and those that don't. The same way we would have people that only prefer to come to the office and pay in cash and demand a signed receipt for them to go home, they would put that in a old peanut butter jar, dig it in the ground and cover it up. Those people still want to have that touch. It's still offered. You're gonna to have to wait in the line, especially with COVID, to be able to get that personal touch. But other people that are comfortable with already using the, the wallet mechanism of paying where they're going or, or credit cards where they're using PayPal, they're already buying things online, paying their taxes or getting a car registration renewed is just as simple as ordering something off of Amazon Prime. They type in, they receive it at their home. So I'm assuming if someone came into the office, the best kind of feedback that you could get from them was that was fast, that was easy, um, you know, effective, friendly, but you've, it seems like you found a way even with technology by putting things online, they still feel like they're getting that same fast, easy experience with a friendly touch. That is exactly what we want. Efficient, ethical, and effective. We can get the product to you in the way that you want. If you still want to come to the office, we're still open. But as you see that trend, as people that are making the payments, that are doing the actual transactions, as we're moving to a newer, more electronic generation, people that were born with a cell phone in their hand, already using that technology, to them, it's a no brainer. They don't necessarily want to take time out of their day to go to the DMV. They don't want to travel to the tax collector's office. They want instant gratification. They want to pay it right now and we're ready to accept that credit card payment. And you brought up Amazon Prime a minute ago. Amazon's famously so customer centric. I think they even say customer obsessed. Um, where do you see those trends even with government uh, with payments uh, in terms of just making that such an easy process for someone It used to be maybe six clicks or four clicks and you're filling out forms now, you know, we have a lot in our daily lives of one click ordering. Uh, like with Amazon Prime, where do you see government moving in that direction? I'm hoping to see government as they capture the information that they have, not to use it in a bad way, but to make it more effective instead of filling out a form as if 
we've all gone to the doctor's office and they give us a clipboard and you fill out your name and your birth date and your insurance information, you turn the page and you have to do the same exact thing on the next sheet. That's redundant and that's foolish and it's not a way that the government should be functioning. I want to see all of that captured internally so that if this person, John Doe, wants to renew their car tag, we have that information where they don't have to fill it all in to do their hunting and fishing license, to pay their tangible personal property taxes. Everything is there in one database for them to choose what they want to pay. If their birthday is November the 15th, they can say, I want my hunting and fishing license, I want my car tag, I want my title redone, and I want to pay my taxes. All of it can be done with one, choose the option you want, but one financial transaction, pay for all of it simultaneously on that smartphone. So John, from the time that you started in government about 15 years ago, how has technology changed and where do you see it going from here? That is an excellent question. When I first started, there were ledger books in the office, thick, large, heavy, two people had to carry them with special tables to support the ledger books. So we'd have a tax certificate auction and we're physically handwriting the name, the auction, interest rate, the price, everything is recorded by hand. Now we transition not only into the computer systems, but now we're allowing it to take place online through products offered by Grant Street Group. We have an online auction. What used to be a room with 150, 200 people bidding on those tax certificates and over the course of time, a day and a half, we would sell those. But by now using the technology that's provided, we have had over one billion bids per certificate auction from all over the United States, different companies that didn't have to drive in. They too have access to those online services. And what that has done is it's driven down the penalties, if you will, the interest that people have to pay when they didn't pay their taxes on time so that they then have an easier way to pay. The government gets their money. The citizen that can't afford, afford to pay gets the lowest interest rate possible. And the individuals that want to invest in the sale, they also get exactly what they want. It's been a win-win for the government, for the investors, and for those that can't afford to pay. But seeing those changes, like I said, from the ledger books to basic computers, Excel spreadsheets, then going into more complex databases. Now we've migrated all the way to the point where you can bid from the comfort of your home with your slippers on in front of the fireplace and do your transaction. So if you've seen a process that complicated and involving that many par parties do just fine online, do you see a future where the entire office, every service that the office offers can be done online? I think that there will be very few that won't be able to be done online. And this is me being a futurist and saying right now, I know that I can put my thumb on a pad on my, my telephone and it knows who I am off of fingerprint recognition. I have a belief in the near future as technology advances not only are they going to take the biometrics of my thumbprint, but I believe that it will be able to scan my retina or my cornea and make it even a more complex scan so that it proves who I am that's doing the transaction. And as this takes place, more complex things can be moved into a convenience matter. But what we would need that brick and mortar location for people to truly go there has to be a place for that person to be identified to begin with. Who are you? Prove that you are the person that we're now linking into the system so that the people that are doing the process would be the ones making certain that the biometrics are correct. Again, there are people in our society that believe, I don't want the government having access to my biometrics. And that is fine. Those people have that right those would be the ones that would still want to come back to the brick and mortar location and do their transaction face to face. And we love those people and want them to stay. And do you see a future with the biometrics? You're, you're talking essentially about one click 
payments with thumbprint, uh, retina. Uh, do you do you see a future where once identity is verified that this whole thing could be eventually automated and it's actually we go to a zero click type of world when it comes to government payments? I don't think we're gonna see a zero click because we're always gonna have to verify that person that comes in and there's always the next generation, the next person uh, that wants to get a driver's license. They're still going to have to take a driver exam. They're still gonna have to get in the car with someone and go on that, that tour. Those are the type of things that no matter what, until they get to the point of a giant VR simulator if they were gonna drive. But I believe that by putting reality of driving that vehicle in public, the skills that are necessary that go along with the anxiety of a 16-year-old driving a vehicle in traffic, they need to be monitored and checked. But things such as car tags and, and uh, registrations, paying of taxes, that's going to become second nature, like paying your phone bill. So John, when your office is looking to partner with a vendor like Grant Street Group or, or any other, what are the qualifications or what's your checklist look like in that regard? We like to look for trend and what that company has done already. I, I've never been one to take the leap of faith with a startup, but by partnering with Grant Street Group, you had already run millions of transactions you come to the table with a, a high level of integrity. We want that to be in the firm because they, whoever we choose to partner with, becomes the back of the face of the government. Everything that they do reflects directly on us. If there's an error in the code, if there's an error in the system, no one from the public is going to go to the vendor and say they made an er error. It's going to be the government official that's there to take on that responsibility. So I look for a vendor that prides themselves on integrity, that if there is an error, they immediately own and fix. They never come to me with a problem that doesn't already have multiple solutions. When you have the trust with that organization, you know that it's going to go smooth. You can go about other things in the office, human resource issues, outreach issues, as opposed to worrying about, is the technology going to work? When they click the button, will the money go to the bank and the correct bank account? So we're, we're definitely keep our eyes open for quality vendors. And to wrap this conversation up, speaking of the services that you offer being a reflection on, on you and your staff, what impression would you like a customer to come away with, whether they come into an office physically or are using uh, some of the newer online services that you're working on? We pride ourselves in my county on being not a traditional government experience, not being the cliche going to the DMV. We pride ourselves on having over a 90% satisfaction rate from the customers that come in that fill out the forms. We make certain that they're held timely. They don't have to wait in long lines. We offer up appointments for people that are busy that know exactly when they're going to need to be there. We can target those people and when they can come in at a lower point in time for the regular customer flow. We want people to leave feeling that they had a good experience. Because let's face it, nobody wants to go to the government and give them money. Nobody, I don't wanna do that. But what we can give is a smile. We can give the assurance that their transaction is being processed correctly, efficiently, and just use the customer's name if and when possible and tell them to have a great day. We want people to leave knowing that they have had a good experience with the government and their money is going to the right use. John Drew, thank you for joining us today on this edition of Official Insights, Modernizing Government. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me today.